uh, we, we go to this time frame. This is a fantastic chart for everyone. It's on longtermtrends.net. And this is M2 Money Supply Consumer Price Index GDP. The black line is M2, and the, the blue line is uh, GDP, nominal GDP, by the way. And the red line is uh, the CPI. So you see that on this fiat system that you're talking about, Michael, going back to uh, 88 to 2019, the M2 money supply increased by 400%. After George Gammon and Michael Saylor had an argument on Twitter, as discussed in the previous video, they decided to have a conversation to explain their differing perspectives. While George Gammon is a supporter of Bitcoin, he accuses Saylor of using Bitcoin as the perfect solution to solve all the world's problems. In particular, Gammon challenges Saylor on the idea that Bitcoin won't solve inflation. Gammon uses two revealing charts that look at the history of inflation and government spending that leads to an interesting debate about Bitcoin that you don't want to miss. Now let's hear what Gammon and Saylor have to say. My point here, first off, would be if we take this back for the time frame is 18, uh, roughly 1870 to, uh, or 1868, we'll call it 1867 to 1899, you see we did not have uh, fiat money here. In fact, we had free banking. This was prior to the Federal Reserve. And we had um, a, a true gold standard. And you see that the supply, uh, the increase in supply of M2 was identical, identical. So I, my point there is I'm no fan of the government at all. But when you look at that dollar ch chart, you, you, I don't think it's accurate to say that if we had a fixed money supply, that it would completely eliminate inflation. And my problem with that is a lot of people in the Bitcoin community, that, that are people that are nowhere near as sophisticated as you are, go and make, uh, they take extreme risk, like you know, mortgaging their house, let's say, or the, the credit card, because they believe that there's a 100% certainty that if we do go to a Bitcoin standard, let's just say in 30 years, that we will absolutely have deflation and it'll fix all of these problems because there's a belief that there's a one-to-one -one relationship first and foremost, with the number of currency units created and the rate of inflation. And they also believe that the government is pretty much the sole uh, supplier of M2 money supply. And it's and I could go through other time frames. And the punchline here is this. When you, when you look at these charts, you see that there's not really a strong correlation between money supply growth and inflation. As an example, I'll give you here, you know, we see this 400% increase in M2, but yet the uh, goods and services during that time went down by almost 50%, 45% deflation. So there's no way there's a one-to-one -one <coughs> relationship there. And what, what the, the punchline is, what really matters is this money supply growth relative to real GDP. So for, for Bitcoiners or gold bugs or Austrians, if you're, a, if, you, if you're someone that understands the evils, which you point out very, very well with inflation, it, you've got to not necessarily focus on Bitcoin having a fixed money supply, but you more so have to focus on what produces real GDP growth. And the conclusion that I have come to over and over again is this next chart I'll show you, and that's government spending as a percentage of GDP. So you can just track this and as this get, as this increases, and you can go from the 1870, you know, that 30 year time period between 1870 and 1900, go from 1930 to 1960, 60 to 90, 90 to where we are today. And as the percentage of government spending, uh, as, uh, or as the uh, government spending as a percentage of GDP increases, real GDP goes down which makes sense, the productivity is going down. Therefore, when you do get those increases in M2, it translates directly into consumer price inflation. So my, my point here is that a lot of the people in the Bitcoin community will say, well, Bitcoin has to create deflation as an example, because it's just math, it's just math, it's just math. There's only 21 million and the government can't create more. 
But it, that's not what's important, because if we moved into a Bitcoin standard where, let's say, uh, the government revenue was still 18 percent, which is maybe it would be, maybe it wouldn't be. It's far less certain. then we could have an environment where, where, although we have a fixed money supply, we still have consumer price inflation. So uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I, I mean, when we talk about Bitcoin standard, I think a family, an individual or a company can adopt a Bitcoin standard. I, I don't think we're anywhere close to a nation state adopting a Bitcoin standard. And what it really refers to normally is uh, people, uh, people focus upon accumulating and storing their wealth in sound money. And they view the Bitcoin as the soundest money with regard to inflation. I mean, there's three theoretical source of inflation. One is acts of God. If there's an earthquake and you live on an island or, or a tsunami and you live on an island and ships can't get to you and there's a shortage of food or fuel, you're going to have inflation on the island. It has nothing to do with monetary policy. It has nothing to do with political or fiscal policy. It has nothing to do with any policy. You just got struck by an earthquake. Uh, the second source is monetary policy. If there's you know 10 houses in the city and the supply of currency increases by a factor of 10, all other things being equal, the price of the houses is going up probably by a factor of 10. The third source of inflation is public policy. You know, if if um, the federal government uh, legislates a 10-hour work week, common sense says that stuff is going to get more expensive than a 40-hour work week or an 80-hour work week. And if, it, if they put a tariff or they make it illegal to import cheap products from China or to fabricate semiconductors in Taiwan, the price of those things is going up. So, so I think if we're reasonable and intellectually honest, we'll say that, that um, all sorts of policy interventions, be they monetary or you know, defense policy, right? Foreign policy, wage and price controls, <laughs> Uh, labor policy, all these policies can create inflation. And my, my general view, and I think most Bitcoiners' general view is, we want less government and we believe that most public policy intervention is inflationary. And inflation itself caused by po a political process generally is not good for, for the world. And Yep. If, if the politicians weren't passing a law making it illegal to manufacture something somewhere, then someone would have manufactured it and they'd be selling it to you cheaper. And, and so the market economy is functioning in order to drive the price of everything down whenever it can. And the public policy is driving it up. And, and so the other point I'd make, George, though, is you talk about the government, but in fact, there's 180 different governments. So so you could say, well, I think that the United States didn't create as much money as whatever. Well, what about Venezuela and what about, you know, Argentina and what about Brazil and what about everywhere? Everybody in the world, all 8 billion people is struggling with, uh, with money supply or, or currency supplies that are being manipulated by every government. They're also struggling. The other source of inflation and money supply expansion or currency supply expansion, to be precise, is fractional banking, right? So the banks can create uh, additional currency units, the governments can create additional currency units, and the victims are always the people, and the beneficiaries are always the banks and the political systems. Right, right. And but so, there, Michael, we go back to that idea that there is a one-to-one -one relationship where if you increase M2 money supply by one unit, you're going to get an, an additional one unit of consumer price inflation. And when you look at that chart, the, the one that we uh, went over earlier, I won't go over it again, you see that there isn't really a good relationship. George, you're showing a manipulated metric. You're showing CPI. And I just showed you that the inflation rate is double on gold and it's double again on land. Yeah, but and no, this is back in the 1800s, Michael. We, we saw a 400% increase in M2 and we saw prices go down by 50%. Well, if we study monetary history, we know we had hyperinflation in the Revolutionary War. We know we had hyperinflation in the Civil War. Right. So it, we've we've had many bouts of hyperinflation and they all came along with printing, you know, wheelbarrows and wagons full of paper currency. Well, that that but that's where the government is creating the currency. And in this case, it would have been the banking system creating those additional currency units to lend to entrepreneurs to create more goods and services. So that, 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 that's a big difference there. And then it goes back to what you're saying earlier about this inflation, the, the root cause of this inflation 
isn't necessarily the creation of additional currency units. That's the point I want to make, especially if those currency units are going up with pretty much the rate of real GDP. The problem is when the currency units being created, whether it's by the government or the banking system, go up in excess to real GDP as a result of the government being a bigger, bigger, bigger part of the overall pie, which creates less productivity, I'm, which makes real GDP okay, go down. Okay, so, I mean, based on my lifetime in business and the last few hundred years of economic history, I have a, a, a vague awareness with, it seems like the real GDP or the 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 total supply of goods and services or capital equipment in the economy grows about two or three percent a year. Like when the economy's working and everything's working normally, you get about two or three percent more a year. And under a gold standard, when the gold supply was growing at two or three percent a year, you could probably have stable prices because the currency supply is is incrementing at the rate of additional goods and services. No, no, et look, the, the base money is correct, Michael, but the broad money that's chasing goods and services, the number of currency units, like we see right here, can increase massively, massively. Yeah. So the point is, the government's clearly inflating the currency supply by more than two percent a year. We know uh, that. Well, back Although, here, otherwise, your house wouldn't cost 500 times as much in 90 years. How do you yep. explain the fact that a house cost $40 million today that cost $100,000 90 years ago, other than the fact that there's a lot more currency and the currency units are much weaker than they were 90 years ago? Because real GDP hasn't kept up with the creation of currency units because the government's portion of spending of the overall pie measured in GDP has been increasing. That, that that's the real problem here. It isn't necessarily the money supply. You see, and let, let me- well, if, you, if, you, if you want to say that the government is spending too much money and, and exerting too much centralized control over the economy, and that's the source of inflation, I don't disagree. Like the, yeah. uh, the source of inflation both... is policy intervention by the government. And if you, if you want to take an anti-inflationary view, limit the policy intervention or stop intervening in the economy, make the government smaller, shrink it, down to the bare minimum, and you're going to have much less inflation. I completely agree. So that's where I go to the, the... I highly recommend that you check out this video where George Gammon reminds Twitter why he does not like Michael Saylor, which leads to a heated Twitter debate that you don't want to miss. Click this video now.